this is a class that's always um, uh, like the first class is is a broad view of a lot of things, right? And then talking about like what's trendy and what where the direction of things are going. By the way, there's a lot of um, fake sake accounts. Yeah, Which apparently. <laughs> I don't understand the. I don't. I. I want to what they. I just want to know what their end goal is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of, I'm really curious actually for like morbid, you know, curiosity, not morbid, but yeah, curiosity's sake. Because Taka, um, uh, Mimuro Sugi, Anamasa Jiko, you know, those are some like pretty big names in the soccer world. So I was like, really? I caught on to the fake Jiko character. Yeah, it was, um, yeah, you know, you're like, oh, Anamasa is following me again. That's nice. And then you're like, oh, that's fake. <laughs> Onisan and from Jikon is feeling very um, like personally attacked for some reason though. I was like, don't you know? I think you're just popular, and he's like, I, I have to try to get to the bottom of it. I'm like, I don't think we're gonna really get to the bottom of it. No. Yeah, I think it happens when you get to a certain amount of, um, yeah, like subscribers or I don't know, certain amount of notoriety. Yeah, that's fair. Dachi got got it too. People were trying to give away, like they were, you have to put in your, what is it, like credit card info, you know, to win a prize. I'm like, all right, well, you never do that, everyone here, just in case you didn't know. I hope you do, but do not add your, do not put in your, um, yeah, info in there. All right, well, enough of my PSA. <laughs> I'm going to go into my actual um, presentation. <laughs> okay. So uh, start from here. So how many tastings do you think you do in a week, Nick? I feel like it's probably what, like three, four? No, more than that, like four or five, depending. Yeah, on I do four, about four or five for work and then two hacker geckos, which oh, is something. Thank you. So, that's like um, a lot. It is a lot, um, but be, hacker gecko is the one where I can for lack of a better word, relax a little bit more. Yeah. You know, but you're more in, in like the focus. So that's nice. <laughs> yeah, um, so you have to be the one that's like doing it all, right? <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. But usually people are lovely. And if people are lovely and polite and curious, then mm. a, a session, it only goes for an hour. So it's very easy. Like yeah. you can get through it. It's when there's a tough crowd and that happens so very rarely oh. um, that you, it's a fight. It's a real fight to like. Yeah, yeah. Well, you don't want that. Yeah, yeah, through the lines. Like a not very funny comedian or something. You know, I don't understand why <laughs> it wouldn't be nice drinking sake, wine or sake. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so today is day two. Um, it's session two. Um, I bought a wine glass to taste this week to make you all proud. Oh, good job. Yeah. <laughs> You gotta so are you gonna you have to use that one glass for all your sake tastings from now on. You should like etch it. We should make wine glass or we should make sake glasses that just say sake glass on wine glasses. You know, after the wine. That's kind of cute. Yeah. I can I can get us a deal on it. I I know a guy. Really? Okay. Uh, is it Zeltos? Because I only want. They're not Zeltos, um, but I'm getting some for wine coach. So maybe Ooh. when the wine coach ones arrive, you can have a look at them and yeah, um, see what. That sounds really fun. Yeah, I guess etching on Zeltos is probably not a great idea. Well, I'm sure it's done actually. Yeah. Ballsy yeah. move, but some, I'm sure somebody does it. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, so today is all about, well, not all about actually. Okay, we need to recap a little bit. And we talked a lot about the, uh, the, the big ways that sake is classified. We talked about adding alcohol, not adding alcohol, polish. Um, but I want to put that into context again and to make sure that we're really clear about what a honjozo is, what a ginjo is, so that, you know, when you see uh, a bottle of whatever Jimmy Ginjo at a store or in a restaurant, then you can be like, okay, I know what that is. It's going to probably be fruity. It's going to be a little melony, most likely, and it's going to taste something like this, right? So uh, that's where I want to start off with. And then we're going to go into shubo categories. So Shubo or Moto uh, sake starters, right? And we have four sakes that Mijiro has uh, found in, and put into bags for us so that we can really see um, what that influence is. And there's some pretty cool ones. Like I think there's ones that you might recognize like Tengumai um, that's aged for two years and like really 
salty and savory. And then we have ones that are a little more out there. And then, uh, yeah, everything in between, right? And what they taste like, of course, is really the big thing. And a lot of these are gonna be, I think, fun ones to pair with food in the future for everybody. And if you're having dinner right now, cause it's 7 p.m. and whether you're having sushi or pickled eggs, again, like me, or like other pickled things, um, or curry, you know that rice magazine that you were talking about yesterday? Um, they, their newest one, I think, for this year is um, all about curry. It's like Japanese people right now are really into different, all of these different kinds of curry. Anyways, I feel like some of these sakes would be really nice with like, uh, what kind of curry? And there's obviously saying curry is not the, the, <laughs> the best, <Yeah. laughs> uh, but like spicy, like, you know, warm spice, like aromatic things, um, intensity is higher, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, and next week is going to be uh, moving on to regionality and uh, east and all that kind of stuff. Japanese curry. Mm, yeah, guiriko curry is really good. My mom tried to bring back some guiriko curry from Japan a few years ago. And the ones from Japan have a lot of meat in them, like meat powder, I think, extract. And she got into a lot of trouble at customs. So don't do that. That's my Aww. curry story. Um, okay, <laughs> recap. So the two main ways to categorize sake, hopefully you remember what some of these are. So one, the main thing that people, that we talk about a lot is the rice polish ratio, right? And we can't um, forget about that. It is um, a really fundamental uh, like idea, I guess. And one that I also uh, say, you know, ignore it sometimes too, <laughs> because there's so many things that we can overcome or really like challenge now with other techniques like temperature and yeast and and uh, methods of fermentation, right? So, but it is really important to know what this means in order to like progress from there. So, right, rice polish ratio is one way. So, if it's seventy percent, sixty percent, all that kind of stuff, I have slides for that in a second. And then the two big, uh, the second three thing is adding alcohol versus not adding alcohol whether it's aruten or not, will change the sake greatly. And if you recall in uh, last week, sake number one and number two, that was the example to show you what happens when you add alcohol texturally and, and um, uh, like thinness texturally, the structure of it, aromatics, all that kind of stuff. And what influences style? Uh, some of the things um, we've already touched on, temperature, East uh, design, so what the brewer is trying to accomplish with that, right? What do I want to, to make out of just rice and water and koji? So you've seen this before, shinpaku is the, is the white heart and uh, sake rice has shinpaku uh, of all different sizes and shapes, but uh, table rice is not. So if you're having rice at home right now or you're having sushi, most likely you're not eating sake rice sushi, so you will not see it in, in that rice. Um, but you can see in these two pictures here that there is this very uh, kind of clear definition of this darker white part, then that's the white heart, the shinpaku. And that is where we have the concentration of starch at its highest. It doesn't mean that there isn't uh, starch anywhere else. It's actually like dispersed and mixed in different places, but you have the highest concentration of starch in the middle. You see the word um, RP, RPR often. Some people, some labels like write it out, but some don't. Not all jurisdictions, even within Canada, need to have this. Actually, um, I don't think the LCB or BCLDB really know what it is. <laughs> so I think the very first time I moved here and we were putting labels on, someone, I think one CSR was like, is that the alcohol percentage? Like, no, <laughs> that is the polish, right? So you don't have to put that on there. Uh, for sake in Japan, usually it's if it's um, if it's graded sake, like if it's not fudushu, then you have to have the polish on there. So you can kind of like, look around if you've been around, if you've seen enough labels now, even if it's in Japanese, most likely you can figure it out. Yeah. Uh, the outside layers, and I put layers in quotation marks because it's kind of misleading sometimes, but it isn't like a banana peel. It isn't like an egg uh, where you can take off the outside, but you do have this separation, uh, this differentiation between the outside parts that have more fats, more proteins, lipids, vitamins, uh, more nutrients, right? And these nutrients equal flavor, which is why the more you take away, the less nutrients you have and the less flavor you have. 
polishing. I, uh, we saw this last week too. So as it gets smaller, the more it's polished, you see the concentration of starch get higher here, right? And sometimes, um, well, some breweries we'll talk about now about exactly what kind of shape the rice is for polishing. Um, if you, even if you use the same machine, you can program it apparently now where the rice goes under like a little bit of a topspin. If you imagine someone playing tennis and the ball gets topspin or the rice gets topspin so that you have this different shape at the end of the day. Um, it can be like a sphere, it can be the um, kind of this shape or it can also be flat. Like these are all things that um, if you ask, most brewers will tell you what the kind of polishing they do, but uh, Fukucho, it's a brewery uh, in Hiroshima. Uh, Miho-san, she's the brewer and she actually has a, a label that has the drawings of the flat polishing versus the uh, spherical polishing on her labels. It's really cute. I think it's only in Alberta for some reason. So brown rice is 100%. You can go to 70, 60, 50. Um, you can also do everything in between, right? Like um, I know a producer who does, what is it like 70, uh, 79% just because it's like, I just said 79 because I like that number kind of thing. So, or uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess you could pick anything. Like you pick like 66 or, you know, like whatever you, you want <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, but it's uh, what you are left over by volume, by weight, not by volume, sorry, by weight is what you are um, basing this off of. Uh, some of you, this might be the first time you're seeing these words, but don't worry too much about them because I'll go over them over and over again. Okay, so minimum requirements, these are numbers that you have to hit in order to call something one of these names, right? But that's the minimum, that word is really important because you can make, um, let's see, I do my Ginjo, with 60% um, rice, or you can make it with 40% rice. Please ignore this one. It's not Jumai Daiginjo. I'm pointing to it and just realize I have like a very <laughs> bad moment right now. It's like, oh my God, that's wrong. So six, this one here is, is incorrect, but let's start with 100%. 100% rice, brown rice. It can be Jumai, right? So pure rice or sushu. This sushu in red means table rice, uh, so uh, table socket. And this is, a, you can do anything with sushi. So it can be declassified uh, jimma, it can be declassified honjozo, it can be a declassified anything. It's just table sake. It means that um, you don't even have to use, um, if you're using sake rice, it doesn't have to be in the graded sake rice world. So you're, you're kind of really free to do what you want. But there is this like kind of general understanding that sushi are table sake, their volume, they're a little bit less. Um, premium, but they're really tasty if you get good ones. Yeah, actually, like the hidden hidden gem of the sake world, I'd say. And then you have seventy percent polish, which is honjozo. Um, you do add alcohol for this, or most jimmais are around seventy percent. In two thousand two, they decided that jimmais don't need to be polished any number. It can be anything as long as there's no added alcohol. So, but for the most part, you do see jimmais at around seventy percent, unless you're kind of a strange, like a weirdo producer, like Anamasa or Sinking or uh, the Honke that does like really, really lightly polished sake. Okay, 60% is ginjos or jimmai ginjos. I'm really sorry, it's not jimmai dai ginjos. Um, and then 50% is the minimum level for dai ginjos and jimmai dai ginjos. The most polished sake um, right now is less than 1%. It is tens of thousands of dollars. And I think that's a lot of money. So uh, if you find it and you wanna drink it, go for it and share some with me, but uh, I think it is a very expensive endeavor. Uh, so the, again, you can see that the, the more you polish, the smaller it becomes and the number becomes smaller. So if you've seen Desai, it's kind of like the easiest way to think about um, polish and it's a really good way to taste it as well. So 45, 39 and 23 for, for Desai now. So they only make Jimai Daigin Joes. And you can see how that flavor changes because they're not changing anything really. And their real, their vision is to um, make Daigin Joes accessible for everybody, right? So you can you can drink the Desai 45 for it probably in BC for 40-ish. That's pretty good, yeah. Um, 23 gets really expensive, but yeah. I would drink the 45 and 39 personally. 
over the other two. Yeah. So this graph, we're putting it into this like grid. Um, probably you've seen in some other places in the bottom. Uh, at the bottom, I have this question, do you add alcohol or not? So if you add alcohol, there's this word called aruten. Japanese people love shortening words and smashing them together. And aruten is for arukoru, so alcohol. Ten is for tenka, which means to add. Right, so um, to add a file to your email is tempu, <laughs> so it's, it's that that character and alcohol mashed together is aruten. So you can sound really like professional if you say to somebody, "Is this aruten?" Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, we have on the left hand side all the gym mice, and then on the right hand side all the non gym mice. Right, and so this um, the words kind of correspond as you can see. And we'll go through in a second. The bubble um, talks about aromatics, refinement, uh, simplicity, purity, and it, all these things go up as you go up typically, right? You can have, again, like a um, exception to the rule and have a, I don't know, let's see, a honjozo that's really aromatic and quite complex. But in general, we have the, like the prettiness and the aromatics and this like perfuminess go up as you go from like Jinmai to Jinmai Daiginjo, for example, or Honjozo to Daiginjo, and it becomes more refined, more pure, more clean, and more simple too, because you're polishing away more flavors. Yeah, it's very seldom that I like, I'm like, oh, I feel like drinking a Daiginjo. You know, I, it actually doesn't happen that often, I feel like, if I'm gonna admit it, um, because they're, they're quite pretty. Um, you might have a glass, and then you might be like, let's move on to something else, right? Yeah. Yeah, you're not going to live down the Daiginjo, Pinot Grigio. <laughs> right? Never. Yeah, but I, I did definitely agree. It's again, like, I don't go, okay, I want to drink a Daiginjo with a Nishiki, 40% polish that, that often. <laughs> okay. Um, where's my arrow? So if we do not add alcohol, if it's not aruten, right, then we have the left-hand side, which is all the gym mice. The gym mice, the characters for some people who can read mean pure rice. And don't get like fixated in the word pure. There is, um, There are some people who say gym mice are the only way to go, um, but uh, that's not. I don't think that's personally true. You can, you have all, all sorts of things. Like you don't want to just drink a single malt scotch only from the Jura. Like you want to drink different things, right? So um, Jim Mai's on the left, Honjozo or Aruten on the right. And if it doesn't say Jim Mai, you have to assume that it does have added alcohol. Mm. So there was this um, there was this scandal a few years ago that there was a brewery I think in Ishikawa that um, no this one was Yamagata Prefecture where apparently one of the brewers working in the in the tanks um, he accidentally added alcohol to a Jinmai tank and um, it became national news <laughs> because <laughs> uh, <laughs> sold it as Jinmai and it got like uh, you know this person this one guy got to be the not the villain but like the culprit and it was fired i think instead of the news article yeah, so i don't you know you can imagine that's a pretty big thing but i also feel like did he get like scapegoated because how is it that it's one person you know yeah, yeah absolutely yeah there's a lot of like wine scandals and sake scandals i feel like that yeah we could we could make a podcast about also, whenever i see pictures or videos of in a sake brewery there's always like six people crowding around a pot like there's always a hundred people like doing every little step so like I don't I I don't think I think it was yeah he was a scapegoat right yeah like it's it's uh, there's a lot of people doing like overseeing kind of each other but there's also not that many people either so like really could, could just one person make that rule and you know it's, it's a big operation anyways um yeah that's my sake news and hello mm, that's crazy <laughs> Uh, so more polished again to to like you know hammer this in the more polished you have more uh, you have less nutrients you have cleaner pure simpler uh, more polished means that you have a lower rice polish number right if you don't polish very much so you have less polished this is uh, we have more rice left over right? just to like clear that up 
um, some, some tests for sake. I love putting things like this into multiple choice and making you <laughs> think too hard about it. Yeah. But again, the more you polish, right, the, the cleaner it is, the less nutrients it has. Uh, and then ginjo styles of sake, we need temperature control. Uh, for anyone who does beer brewing, you have lower temperatures for uh, pilsner versus, or lagers versus ales, same kind of theory. Um, and you also have particular yeast for brewing beer as well as for sake. Right? And in week three, next class, we have um, sakes that really illustrate the differences between yeast and even things like flower yeast. So I think for, yeah, for week three, for next week uh, for Vancouver, we have um, a flower yeast sake again, um, a strawberry blossom yeast. Yeah. Okay. So what do they taste like? These are the sakes that we tasted last week. Um, I put them hopefully in the, in the right places. Yeah, okay. So the sake number one was the Honjozo was the Hakkai-san Tokubetsu, but it's a Honjozo policy 55%. It was, Added, it is an added alcohol sake. And if you remember, it was like quite um, light and um, texturally a little thinner than if you compare it to the second one, which was a Jinmai. So this comparison of Honjozo versus Jinmai or just a Jinmai versus a non-Jinmai, I think is just like really key to understanding what that adding alcohol does right? and that lift and like the aromatics that you can have with, with this process. And it's a it's a choice, like you know, it's a stylistic choice, not a um, not to say that this is better than the other. And we did talk about how like competition sakes are often added alcohol daigenjos, right? So um, that still stands. And then the gusan, we had the jimmai uh, jimmai ginjo, the pink one, which really kind of tasted like this label. I feel like it was really like kind of candy fruity, yeah. And I think it was East number fourteen as well, if I recall. Correctly. So it really showed that like um, mo modern style of Ginjo. And then this uh, Matsumoto uh, Yamada Nishiki, the Shuhari that we had is in this quadrant kind of, but I think, uh, you know, he wouldn't want to call it that, right? He wouldn't really <laughs> like us saying this, um, but it is polished to a Daiginjo level, but he's not calling it Daiginjo. And that's really um, a direction that a lot of brewers are going. Also for the Jimai, put Jimai ish. Not all Jimmais are thick and earthy and rich. Uh, some people, like when we have uh, the Yamahai for tonight, the Tangamai, kind of think about Jimmais in that, in, like this. But this is a Yamahai, it's also aged for two years, so that's not necessarily um, like textbook Jimmai, especially not anymore. But this Chida, I think, was really pretty. I think you, like, you really liked it too, right, Nick? That's yeah, okay. really good. Was one of my favorites too. So it's Jinmai, it's not Ginjo, but it has this lightness that's really nice. And this one too, I think the green label really spoke to me. I ordered a case um, for the shop after I <laughs> tasted it. Like, Show, do you have this? Like, yeah. Um, okay, so that's the, the that's the um, you know putting things into context that we tasted last week. Um, hopefully, this is really uh, pretty clear for everybody. Because if you remember these four sakes from week one, then you can kind of work around this for any sake or any sake list at this point, right? Like if you go into the BCLDB store, you go into Dachi or you know to Kit's Wine Cellar, you should be able to find, you'll find these words that you tasted last week and put them into this diagram. So what is shubel? Uh, so shubel, is written as the, these characters up here. So I know for simple, that's pretty easy, but sake mother, right? So, and then the next word over is moto. So both of these words mean the same thing. They're both talking about the East starter. And this is um, extremely important. So number one is always koji for any sake maker. They always say that's like the heart and soul of it, right? Like you got to get the koji right or else your, your design or your flow of fermentation is um, not going to be what you want. Then number two, the second most important thing is the shibo. So also um, aligning with that, the most like senior and maybe the most like trusted person at the brewery is in charge of the koji room. And then the second, maybe in line, or the second most trusted person is in charge of the shuwa room. So when they tell you who's in charge of who, I'm like, oh, okay. So you're you're the most like responsible or the longest uh, standing staff, and then you're the second, and then there's everyone else. 
So Sakya Mother, uh, another word for it is moto, which um, means the origin, um, but it always for, is specifically talking about, I already said that, yeah, uh, specifically talking about sake, the left-hand part of this kanji of the Chinese character has the part for sake that you might recognize on this, this half there, yeah. Um, the purpose of the moto stage is to make sure that you have enough yeast cells for a healthy uh, fermentation. This is the only place that yeast gets added, actually. There are some exceptions where you don't make a shubo and you put everything into the tank at once, right? It's kind of like um, doing um, bread making really fast. Like there are um, times when you would do that, but let's just assume that most sake is, like 99% of sake is, are gonna go through the shivel part, right? And a shivel tank is smaller, it's easier to control because it's smaller and you want a really, really healthy concentration of yeast so you have less dilution, right? And this is where you have to create enough yeast so that when you put it into the main tank, you have enough yeast. It's kind of like when you make, um, I don't bake and there's like, again, chefs on here, but if, you, if you're making like, uh, I don't know, cinnamon rolls, let's say, and you put your, like, your instant yeast into warm water and sugar or like milk, then you, you need to feed your yeast at the beginning to get it going. And you notice like, if it's not doing anything, it's probably dead and you've had it for 10 years. That's the, that's, this is the kind of stage where we're talking about for sake as well. Yeah, or I guess uh, like a SCOBY for, for um, what is that called? Uh, kombucha, um, or for making like fear water, all those things would go through some sort of this kind of um, process, right? So if there isn't enough yeast, what will happen? Well, you have an incomplete fermentation, you run out of gas, so you don't have enough yeast, then you're not gonna have enough alcohol, but also um, fermentation stopping halfway doesn't, very uh, doesn't taste very good apparently, so I've been told. I really want to ask a brewer next time to save me that because I, I would like to taste an incomplete fermentation. Uh, styles. So there are two main categories and then all the variants within it, but there's two main ones. So don't get too concerned about these different words that you might see and where they fit because there's only two main ones that you really need to worry about. Okay, but before we talk about that, uh, yeah, this is my photo that I like to use a lot. <laughs> Ask me for somewhat serious like biopics. I'm just like, this is what I'm going to give you. <laughs> Feels more appropriate. This is, uh, this is an anom anomaly though, right? This is not a normal shibble tank. This is an amphora that Nida Honke was experimenting with. Um, I'm not sure where they exactly got it from, um, but uh, they were experimenting with this um, amphora and also a barrel, a wooden barrel uh, shibble tank. But, the whole point is to have a healthy yeast population. And there's other things, there's other yeast in the air um, that will come into play, but the whole, again, the goal is to have enough sake yeast or whatever sake that you choose to overpower it. Um, on this left picture, these are all vials of yeast. You can see uh, this will make more sense maybe in the next class, but K1401 is East 1401. Um, you see K1801 over here, East number 1801. East number 18 versus 1801. 01 is a mutation. So you have an East that doesn't foam. So if you have a lot of foam, um, some beer guys were telling us last week too that it can get pretty messy if you, if you have like a runaway beer tank that uh, overflows. And it's the same for sake as well. So they found some uh, mutated yeast that don't foam, don't bubble as much, and they uh, made that commercially available. Yeah, but it's a combination of foamless and foam, foamy yeast. Yeah, this is Ayaka who sells sake here for us in For That's Life, who is probably pretending to stir it. <laughs> she's, ah. <laughs> that's just working hard, but yeah, I feel like it was a photo op a little bit. Uh, you can see, so this is a shovel tank and you can see there's uh, temperature controls. It's like, um, you know, monitored. It's in a smaller tank. It goes up to her waist, so it's pretty small. It's on a, a fermentation tank. This is a shovel tank. Right. And this room is um, probably separate from the rest of the fermentation so that you can keep this part relatively clear. This is this is uh, Mitobe-san's brewery, Yamagata Masamune. And um, 
this is for their kimoto making for their natural lactic fermentation for their um, main fermentation style they would do it in a, a room that looks like um, an operating table or sort of an operating room that is really clean and really sterile whereas this they need the natural lactic bacteria to create um, the good conditions that we need I feel like the style for wine winemakers and brew, brewers are pretty different too. You know? Like winemakers wear what, like t-shirts and jeans, right? Whatever they want. Mm -hmm. yeah, whatever they want. Whereas with sake, you gotta wear like hats, you gotta wear gloves, well, not gloves all the time, but you look like you're in a lab for sure. Yeah. yeah. Depends on the on the brewer's style, but definitely it's a lot more uh, regulated. Oh yeah, I have a video here. I'll show you in a sec. Mm. So shibo making is done in a smaller tank, so there's more control, there's better control. If you do this in the big tank, then it's harder to raise or, or lower the, the temperature, right? Underneath these tanks, there's um, often a little heat lamp or just like a, what well, looks like you hang in a garage, um, but that's enough to get it warm enough that it, it gets bubbly or it gets going. Uh, temperature and other environmental factors. So you, you are monitoring it to see, uh, to make sure that it's, it's on its path. Uh, once, one shivo, so one tank, so this one that Ayaka is stirring, uh, could become multiple batches. It could also just be one, um, but often you're gonna kind of save time a little, perhaps by making two starters with this. So I've, I know my voice gets a little quieter after this usually. That's good, this one. Oh, great. So uh, kind of like uh, winemakers as well, there are people who say, okay, we stir very little. We do like how you did this like batonage, I don't know, like less than some people. Uh, it depends on, on your thinking, but you do have to mix it to some degree because, uh, you know, you've got like a sludge of rice, like it starts, right? So you have to, you have to mix it to get it going. Um, and in the picture here, you see on the on the left, the darker one is for Kimoto making. So it's really um, designed. I mean, it's not like a very um, high end um, piece of uh, what's word equipment, but it is designed to be flat, and so that you can push it, uh, the solids down with that. Whereas on the right, the lighter colored one is to mix it. Right, it's not meant to be like pushing it against the against each each other. Uh, but the two main ways, right? So number one is sokujo, number two is kimoto. So these are the two main ways that uh, the starters, the shibol is um, differentiated and everything that we talk about with Yamahai or with uh, hot temperature, kimoto, hot temperature, sokujo, these are all um, derivatives of sokujo and kimoto. So these are the two that you have to remember and everything else is kind of you know optional if you wanna, if you wanna learn it or not. So uh, if you see the if you see the characters, it means fast fermentation and fast it is um, by time it is much faster. So this takes about twice as long as it does for Kimoto, but this is the main method for most sake. The majority of sakes are made this way. And when we get, talk about trends, it, Kimoto is really definitely popular. Um, everyone's trying their hand at it, some better than others. But uh, even now with some people trying they're not going to like fully flip into Kimoto breweries all overnight. So that's um, uh, Sokujo is still the main main method. And this was perfected in the early 1900s. Pretty impressive considering what was like, like not around in the early 1900s. Yeah. yeah, but this is when they said, okay, lactic acid, if we can create lactic acid like in a lab, commercially sell it and put it into our starter, then we can lower the pH and we can make a clean environment, and then we add the yeast. Okay, so we're making it sterile uh, in, the uh, in the mash, and then to that environment, we can add yeast, and then it'll be healthy. Right? So the temperature for this usually is around 20 to 25 degrees, and it takes about two weeks. Uh, with Kimoto, uh, the characters being raw moto, and this was done until the early 1900s. So this is um, 
this includes again Yamaha, Bodaimoto, all these ones that we were going to talk about. But until the early 1900s, this was the main way. Well, this is the only way. Sorry, that sake would have been made because, well, first of all, they didn't know how else to really do it. But hundreds of years of practice and practical experience has uh, taught them that even without adding lactic acid, if you have an environment where there's lactic acid bacteria and that creates lactic acid, then you can add your yeast and it's safe, right? So it's not natural yeast. You do add yeast for the most part. You can use natural yeast. I am a lot of some breweries definitely go down that rabbit hole of making everything natural, um, but it is not a, like you don't assume that all Kimoto's, all Yamaha's are natural yeast. And in fact, most aren't, right? Um, so this, you don't add lactic acid, but you have the as lactic acid bacteria naturally to create lactic acid over time. Now, we, I learned recently, actually, that uh, the lactic acid bacteria, you can um, add that as well. So if you have lactobacillus, then you can buy that, actually, and add that to your tank, and then you have lactic acid created. Right. And then there's a bunch of other acids that are in place that work together um, to make a clean environment. Yeah, and the temperature is really cold, six to seven degrees. If you look for Sokujo, it's it's a lot colder and it takes four weeks, it takes double the time. So this is where we're using this brown, darker pool to mash things together. If you're adding lactobacillus, does it still count as Kimoto? Yes, it does. So as long as you're not adding lactic acid specifically, then um, you can call it Kimoto. Okay, what do you mean by safe? Is alcohol not high enough to kill bacteria? Um, it is not high enough because you're cre you have to create the alcohol over time. At this stage, at the Sokojo, or sorry, at the um, uh, Moto stage, right? At the um, starter stage, you don't have any alcohol because you're still trying to, that's before, we're talking about before creating alcohol. Yeah, and also um, sake yeast is, um, is actually quite resistant to alcohol and the other other yeast that you might not want are less resistant to alcohol but um, it's not enough to to balance it all out and lactic acid is um, yeah is the kind of the the most effective way yeah is your yeast trade um, for example people craft beer here in Vancouver cubic yeast from Norway the popular import yeah, so yeast is purchased from the uh, Brewer Society and you can buy yeast number seven, you can buy yeast number six, you can buy all sorts of yeast. And that is how the majority of brewers um, uh, get a hold of yeast. Here, like, yeah, in Canada, you can also get yeast number uh, seven and nine. Like you can get sake yeast as well. No. Okay, uh, differences. So the, whether or not you're adding lactic acid, that is the main thing. So Kimoto, if you, it's actually not very, uh, not very clearly defined in the sake lexicon. But the biggest, like, the, sort of the only thing that differentiates Kimoto, Kimoto to Sokujo is whether you add lactic acid or not. Right. The what is being done physically, as we'll find out really soon, is um, usually not. It's not dictated. So legally, lactic acid, yes, no. That's the only question. Um, but this is we're talking about how protection is created, right? So with Kimoto, we're creating this um, this protection naturally because the lactic acid bacteria is creating lactic acid. Um, and also with Kimoto, we have uh, lower temperatures because if you have low temperatures, most likely like weird yeast or not weird, but like things that you don't <laughs> want, yeah, <laughs> weird yeast can't uh, contaminate it, but also less water. Uh, if you think about um, when you make jam and you add a lot of sugar, right, to your, to your jam, um, that concentration of sugar is, is also another like protection to your, to your, you know, jamming technique, technique to your, yeah, to that um, uh, method. Right, uh, with sake as well, if you have a lot of sugars that you've created and less water, that is also protection against things coming into your, into your sake mash. Um, yeah, the amount of time that it takes to make your Kimoto starter versus your Sokujo starter is, is quite different. And your flavor profile is gonna be different too, as we'll see when we taste the sakes. This is a video of Teoda Honke, I remember now, it's uh, a pr producer in Chiba, and he makes some really 
wild brown rice sake amongst other things and this is what's called a hangiri it's it's a specific um shape and size of uh, a fermentation tank and so with kimoto compared to yamahai the other thing the big thing the main thing is how the rice is uh, mashed right so with kimoto which is older it predates yamahai they thought that you had to use these poles in order to mash and melt the rice physically. So you can see it here. Kind of long, so I might cut it. This is where you go softer. This is where I go softer. Okay. Whatever well, you're right. Do I? Am I still softer? I think you're fine. I think you're fine. So that song. Let me know if, if you can't hear me. The that song. Um, you know, you you could you could hear the the pole against the the um hangi, right, like the barrel too, and it's to keep that motion uh, that rhythm is a big part of it. So that everyone's in sync, everyone's working together. Um, and then you also have different regional songs. So like Noto Toji versus like Northern, uh, other parts of Japan Toji would have had different songs that they bring um, to to their um, workplace as well, right? So it's a, that's a part of like the regionality and what the Noto, or sorry, what the Toji Guild uh, would have taught back in the day. So that is Kimoto traditionally where you're taking your mash, what looks like this like, sludgy, you know, your mash, putting it into these smaller vessels and mashing it physically because they thought, okay, you we got to melt this down, right? And now we know that that is not the case. Like, you don't have to do that. And there's variations within it. Um, but it, as you can see, it's a lot of work. And um, the brewers who are trying now, they're dipping their toes into kimoto making, uh, quickly realized if they were just doing it for, like, looks or for superficial reasons, they would quickly <laughs> learn that it's not easy. Yeah, uh, so it, usually those people stop after a couple of years because it's just like so much work. Uh, but the people who do it and who have always done it maybe, um, yeah, it's good for them because it's, it's a, lot, a lot to go through. So within Sokujo, again, this is the fast fermentation. There are a variety of things that you can do, variants within that, that uh, make a different result. So mid-temperature Sokujo, um, which is kind of like with the majority of uh, Sokujos these days, 25 to 30 degrees Celsius is what your starter tank is at, whereas the high temperature Sokujo is going to be a lot higher. You can see 50 to 55 degrees is a, a pretty big jump. And that means that with high temperatures, that's another um, level of security so that when you add your yeast here, the yeast is, is okay to about 65 degrees, right? Uh, which kind of ties into the fact that when we talk about um, pasteurization la later, 65 degrees is what we want to get to in order to stop the yeast. But at 50 to 55, the yeast is like perfectly happy. It's like warm and cozy and it's at a really mm -hmm. good temperature. So that's the temperature that high temperature pull and sokujo um, goes through uh, where the yeast is still thriving, but other things are not. And that's how we maintain this kind of yeast. But you can also hopefully um, imagine that if you have this high temperature, things are fast, right? At higher temperatures, the yeast uh, metabolizes faster, so things move along a little quicker than you would if you were at low temperatures. This is Celsius, yeah. Um, and then we have regional differences. So 
if you're in a cold region, it's easier to get to use a colder fermentation. Okay? If you're in a warmer area, to cool it down with ice is, is really hard or even with electricity was even harder. So depending on where you are within Japan, uh, you would have had different regional practices. Uh, now we can overcome that again, but um, usually to go against, you know, if you're in a really cold area, you want to make hot fermentation is, is a little, you don't hear about it too often. It's a little awkward. Mm. Um, and then Kimoto, now we have this method that I'm sure a lot of people have heard of called Yamahai. And this is also the early 1900s, but a little later, later in 1909, um, where Yamahai was um, really brought into the, into the uh, in commonplace. And this is the lazy version. It's really not lazy, you know, like it's still a lot of work, obviously, but I, we call it lazy because they uh, realized that you could uh, get away with not mashing your moto. So by increasing the temperature a little bit, um, and by just letting like the yeast and the koji do its thing, um, you like could basically skip this whole step of putting into smaller barrels and then mashing it by hand. Now there are people nowadays like Aramasa and um, Senking and a few others that they say, okay, we're gonna make a kimoto, but we're gonna mash it in bags. So they'll freeze their koji, so it's really cold and like almost deactivated. And then they put their moto into plastic bags and they knead it by hand and they call it kimoto. So it's technically still mashing, but is by hand is this kimoto yamahai. The, the answer is that legally it doesn't matter. Like no one cares if it's hand mashing or not as well, as long as there's no lactic acid included. So kimoto, the uh, raw moto method, which, which is the umbrella to Yamahai and everything else within it, um, is when we're mashing. And Yamahai, I told you Japanese people love mashing words together. Yamahai, so Yamaoroshi, which means to crush the, like the, the mountain of rice, and Haishi, meaning to stop that, became one word, Yamahai. Okay, so Yamaoroshi, Haishi is the long version of it. No one says that. They took parts of the word and mashed it together, came up with Yamahai. Uh, but again, in practice, both are um, under the Kimoto method world. And whether you mash it or you use bags or you use like a mix, a hand mixer kind of thing, Taihizan likes to, or not likes to, they, what they do is they use a hand blender, like immersion blender looking thing, right? Um, yeah, but yeah, as you'll taste later on, most Yamahai sakes compared to Kimoto's are going to be a little um, more rustic and a little fatter and saltier because they're often also aged a lot, whereas Kimoto's are a little uh, lighter and really clean. Where uh, today we also have Bodaimoto, which I'm really excited to taste. And this is a method of Mizumoto, where they use um, partially raw rice. And it was then in Nara, uh, which is the birthplace of sake. Um, and from the 14th uh, or the yeah, 14th century, it goes back to, right? But this um, sake, this Bodaimoto, is a type of Mizumoto specifically done at one temple. It's like a brand of brand of um, uh, shovel starter, but it's a uh, what are we like uh, Trappist beers? We we're saying earlier, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, like you know you have it, you have these certain methods. You know who's making. I'm not sure if the monks how much of a hand they have in it, but we know for sure that the yeast at this temple are and the water from Shodakuji are a huge part of this uh, sake. It's really cool. Nara has. Um, a few producers who are young and are like history nerds, it seems, and they're um, they're trying to figure out how to do old methods, but in their own own um, execution, their own version of it. Yeah, and you get a lot of kind of like yogurty um, uh, drinking yogurt kind of kefir uh, types of uh, aromatics because you get that lactic fermentation. Oh. As a whole, like I usually smell. Um, kimotos and yamahais to be more and, and bodaimotos or yamaha mizumotos to be more like lactic and like you get you know milkiness like you know when we tasted the sinking too like it has that um the ones that are made in kimoto have that 
dairy, mm. yogurt water kind of yeah. quality. Yeah, you can see in this photo here that the, there's ice in these buckets and that is uh, one of the techniques as to how you lower the temperature at a brewery. Yeah, 2021, they're still using ice in metal buckets with wind handles. It's very, uh -huh. yeah, it's amazing how we have good clean sake mostly, yeah. <laughs> Hot temperature sokujo on the uh, picture on the left is amabuki. We'll taste one of his sakes next week. Um, we have, um, you can see blankets. That looks really like a home done, but it's actually a fairly large brewery. And you can see also um, these tubes that have warm water. This is warming the sake to be 55-ish um, degrees Celsius, right? You can see also this like tarp is really humid because it's, it's warm in here. And this kind of sokujo, um, it shortens the time, like we were saying, so instead of two weeks, you probably have like 10 days. Uh, we also have uh, other variations like hot temperature Yamaha. Uh, which is no lactic acid added, but it's also very hot. So 55 degrees um, ish around there. And sake is like Kido Izumi, brewers like Kido Izumi uh, do this method. And you can almost smell the heat, I feel like. You know, you smell this like warm energy to the, to the sakes. And these methods are independent of style, category, intention. So what we want to do. Um, we have a goal in mind, and then we choose like uh, any mix of, of methods to get there. The big thing that you know we we want to talk about is what do they taste like? And uh, as I was saying earlier, Kimoto Yamaha sake is the same thing. So Kimoto, I'm going to say from now on, uh, Kimoto sake is. Um, have these three things that I love about them. So acidity, we have lactic acid that um, is a lot higher in Kimoto's um, compared to Sokujo's. We also have glutamic acid and umami that um, is prevalent in sake as a whole, but we have to be careful here because a lot of times the, the funky, the wild, the um, really kind of like natty styles, which is my least favorite word I think in the world. <laughs> Said it out loud, but that comes, <laughs> that comes from aging, right? That comes from aging the sake for how many ever months or years, even before uh, before they're drunk, and that's not from the Kimoto or Yamaha method itself. You're gonna we're gonna have a taste. We're gonna taste a Kimoto tonight that is not aged and it's not funky. Like it has depth and complexity and like richness, but that's not the defining factor. We also have depth, we have a little uh, like body to it. And I think I said complexity a few times, but you have all these layers and textures that are um, really exciting about the Kimoto Yamaha sakes and Mizumoto's as well. Yeah. They make for a really good um, uh, pairing sakes, especially with food that's not like elegant, pretty uh, Japanese food. You know, if you're having again, like spices or you're having more, um, uh, herbs like Mari, Maria san from Jembai Moto. She uses a lot of Kimoto and Mizumoto sakes with uh, things like cilantro and um, like coriander and things that you don't usually get in Japanese food because they can stand up to those flavors. And you can also open them for like two weeks and they still taste great or even taste better in, in a week or so. Oh, we are there already. Jeez. Okay. Wow. Any questions, everybody, about um, any of these? We had some, I think, interesting questions. Hopefully, it's recently clear. Oh, how come I can't have a question? No, no questions yet. Okay, so if you want to get your four sakes, um, so the sakes that we didn't taste last week, this is the order we're gonna we're gonna go with. And I love the sakes. yeah, me too. We had the first. Um, okay. I I don't know. This, I, I brought out a bigger glass for this. Hey, I'm gonna get my sake. Okay, so get your risk for sakes. You have you know, whatever, th 30 seconds or what you need in order to get them. Oh, no questions. Uh, burying sake at a temple, common for Shinto or Buddhist tradition. Yeah, so uh, burying sake for um, for the gods is, is definitely tradition. Burying sake 
at a temple uh not that i know of like you they might have made like um sake as an offering but it wasn't made for people like it wasn't made for their um for they chew sake like they chew the rice yeah 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 exactly. before koji you would use the amylase in your saliva to break down the starch yeah exactly. yeah you would and, and then, uh, rice, like chomp on it and then spit it into a thing right yeah not a thing it was probably a very important thing like it was probably a very yeah like, and i guess if it's for an offering for god no one's going to drink that sake it's yeah. just gonna it's uh, just gonna go to to the god the heavens yeah yeah uh, traditions, religious history, of Japan. Um, yeah, there's. I mean, you can um, probably go down that rabbit hole pretty easily too to you know research that. Um, some places um, are more kind of like historically significant than others. Places like, for example, Hiroshima or Yamagata are really um, important. Maybe a little bit more now than they were back then. Like Nara is huge. Kyoto is big. Um, also Kobe, those are the places that you might want to kind of start with for the history of, of sake brain. I um, thought about the order of tonight quite quite hard, um, I, so I hope this is going to be um, good. Okay, so Yamagata Masamune, this is the first sake. It is a Kimoto sake from Mitobu san Yamagata Masamune. Um, is run by this uh, very interesting person who used to be nothing to do with the sake industry and then went back to his his family's brewery. A lot of people have this shared story. And uh, he plays guitar, speaks English perfectly with a little accent. It's very cute. And uh, yeah, has two two girls. I think we did a dinner at uh, Burdock, didn't we? I'm very, my mind is kind of... Wow. Yeah. Anyway, so this is this is a Kimoto sake. Um, you put your nose in it, and I don't think. Wait, that was Kuheji, maybe. Oh yeah, no, we did. Okay, thank you, Andrea. We did do a dinner with uh, with Andrea. It was pretty pretty amazing. This like very beautiful like farm to table seasonal cuisine with um, his sakes are very Venice, I think which is why I like using these big glasses. So Akaiwa Omachi is the rice. So Omachi rice specifically from Akaiwa region in um, Okayama prefecture. And he actually only uses this rice. And this is Kimoto polished to 65%. I definitely There's, get that, that lactic yogurty. Yeah. Smell. Like milk, like fresh, fresh milk, you know. And sake number four is going to be back to Sokujo method. So if you even want to like pour that into another glass and use that as your reference point, that, that might be kind of fun. So sake number four is this one, right? So you can pour that into another glass if you've got a couple glasses, just to um, like go to that, like just for nose even. Like this sake is definitely not going to have the, you know, it's really beautiful, but it doesn't have like a lactic quality, this cheesy, milky creaminess that this sake starts off with. Yeah. Um, and on the palate, just like, it's bright, the, the acidity is crisp and juicy but it's quite fat as well, like all around. This is the, um, 1898 is the year that this brewery was, was founded and back then they would have been making Kimoto. That's kind of the reason why they have them. The Hilta and the Gourd is really cute. This design was um, done by somebody who is pretty uh, like a big shot in Japan. And he always talks about how much it cost him. He's like, it was really expensive, more than I thought. <laughs> uh, is expensive. Yeah, says the person who bought his wife an Arcturus jacket last time he was in Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess spending on your wife and spending on a label is a little different, but. Yeah, it's very beautiful. I like this a lot. Right. It's a great level. Yeah. So 65% polish. So you'd expect that like uh, riciness as well, but I think it's really elegant. A lot of people like this sake warmed um, because it, it gets a little sweeter and like a little uh, fatter, uh, but it goes really well with um, like broths and like mushroom, 
Mm, I kind of want to have it with cheese now because I talked about lactic cloth. Yeah, and there's like a pear uh, freshness, like Asian pear maybe. And greenness. Mm. And if you do want to taste sake number four, um, the Hatanokawa just next to it. Because I just realized that both sakes are from Yamagata. Yay. So they, they have like some kind of similarities and they're actually good friends. They do a lot of things together. Um, but this kimoto texture is very different from the sokujo prettiness and lightness of it. Yeah. Brief about heating a sake. Yeah, so when you heat any sake, you're gonna get more sweetness, more richness and texturally, it's gonna get like more thick usually. But because of all this like sweetness you're gonna get from the rice, if you don't have acidity in your sake, like sake number four has some like citrus sweetness, but it doesn't have a lot of acidity compared to something like this. And if you warm a daiginjo usually, they're gonna just be sweet. They're not gonna be very, um, like you can't drink a lot of that because it's just cloying, right? Um, but you, so you wanna pick a sake that has acidity and complexity to bring the enhance that. And usually you kind of, you want more layers or else like, you know, what are you trying to do by warming is I think is the big question. Yeah. Mm. Tasty. Also, okay. So Kimoto's and Yama, uh, being the umbrella for Kimoto Yamaha's, uh, this is not funky at all. Right? Like it's super clean. And the brewers will tell you that if you make Kimoto or Yamaha well, then you don't need to necessarily get richness or funkiness out of the socket. You'll get more complexity, more acidity, but it's actually cleaner. If you think it's actually lower temperature, I, you're uh, taking more time to make the starter. So it's more of a, of like a solid base to start off with. And when you add the yeast there, then you have a clean fermentation. So in some ways now, um, brewers are thinking that this is the way to make cleaner socket to make less uh, off flavors. Then we go to sake number two, which is, and Andrea, I would say that all of these sakes tonight, uh, sorry, exception with the Tateno Kawa, the first three sakes are all like really, really good contenders for warming. Some people, I think, I really like this 1898 chilled personally but some people like it better warm. I know, uh, like Yuko says that, <laughs> says it a lot. But Mito, Yamagata Masamune, so Mito Besan's uh, Omachi is, is um, I mean, not, he doesn't grow it because it's in a different place, um, but it's very, um, a very good sake to see the condition of the rice each year. Like this is, I think, 18 rice and it was a really good year. And, um, he will tell you, okay, so like maybe that year wasn't very good for this race, but I made it, I did a really good job. <laughs> like pat himself on the back publicly. <laughs> I think he kind of enjoys being the shit disturber too. So we were talking about GIs yesterday, like geographical indicate, uh, what? indicator. Mm. Yeah. So Mito Besan is someone who kind of plays within that like Yamagata political world, he'll get asked to do things and he'll he'll do it, but he will also not. Like they asked him to use uh, Yukimegami, uh, which is a local rice for his gin, uh, Daiginjo. And he's like, no, I'm gonna make a Jumai with that. Like <laughs> he'll <laughs> partially participate. And then also be like, no, I actually don't wanna do that. I respect, I respect that attitude. Yeah, you know, like we know people like winemakers like that too, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, the tango one is great. Tango Mai is the second number two. And Tango Mai is the name of the uh, brand. So this is Shata Brewery. Um, Shata, Shata San, the, the family, they make the sakis. Um, and this is uh, Tango Mai is, is the brand name. The Tengu are these like mytholo mythological uh, characters that have, yeah, long red noses and, and wings, right? And they do like kind of like mischief and I think there's like manga versions that are a little more evil, <laughs> but if you Google Tengu, you'll, you'll get what I mean. There's like masks now that represent them. Uh, but Mai means to dance, right? So the Tengu dancing is apparently what happened when they drank the sake. Huh. Yeah. 
and um, uh, oh. the Yokoyama-san, the brand, like export brand um, ambassador, he used to be a hip hop dance instructor and will dance wherever he gets a chance if you give him a little bit of encouragement. Oh, hip hop and sake class. <laughs> yeah. We That's a great idea. Yeah. He, and he has two young daughters who are probably now still only like nine and seven. And he will play them like 90s hip hop videos that look a little too risque in my opinion, but um, he wants to make sure they're like fully in that world. Yeah. Properly educated of 90s hip hop. One of the best eras of hip hop I could. And he, he has like very like modern, you know, like dyed hair. Um, and Tango Mize is very classic kind of like blue blooded, you know, feel. So it, it's always interesting. So this is Yamaha now. And um, even though Yamaha again is in the Kimoto world under that umbrella, if you as a brewer choose to write Yamaha versus Kimoto, then you're, you're saying something there too, right? So this Yamaha is aged for two years, but even when it's first pressed before it was aged, it was probably a little more um, rich and less salty than, than a Kimoto because this brewery actually started making Kimoto recently. I think they're in their third year and that tastes very, very different from this. So um, it's it's a bit of a semantic a semantic choice, but also um, there is um, like what's the word like market acceptance to it too. Is there a rice varietal that sort of suits Kimoto style more than more yeah, than others? I guess. Like um, or do you, is there like do they make Kimoto Yamada Nishiki? Is there like a style like is there a rice that isn't really? Yeah, you can make uh, you can make kimoto with any rice, um, and like Yamada Nishiki, I think mitobe san has a Yamada Nishiki kimoto. Uh, it was part of a series with like kimoto made from three rice, but the the, the Yamada Nishiki is the most elegant still. Like it shows that part of the the character of the rice. Um, this is Kohaku Mangoku, this thing my Yamaha, and that right this rice is usually quite hard and like not as expressive. But by doing it Yamaha and aging it, I think you're able to get more out of it. I think my my usually my favorite kimotos and Yamahais are tend tend to be more of the like omachis and the the flavorful rice combination with like harder water as well. Mm. But you can do it with anything really. And the more modern kimotos now that are like super clean and precise and high acid they're using everything. Yeah. So the red one that you might have seen the Imagine isn't Yamaha, that one is Sokujo, even though it's Asian kind of has this like baby Yamaha feel. But Tangamai, the red, the Imagine versus this thing my Yamaha feels to me like Van Joan versus like, you know, like a baby Van Joan. <laughs> Remember, this is the aging, the two years aging at room temperature in a tank that gives us this caramelization and um, uh, like sweetness and like sodalone, which you get in zero wines, for example. Mm. Yeah. Correct. What was your Jura um, pairing? Did you, have you done that one yet? Have you done that seminar yet? Um, the pairing, the food pairing I did was the um champ de Vaughan, the pollux the pollux oh, yeah. and the with the with maple walnut um, curried maple walnuts that's right that sounds really delicious which sounds like a lot of flavors but again they share the same flavor molecules so they kind of all revolve around the same um you know they feel they feel very disparate but again when you go into like the chemistry of it, they all pair up. And I mean, Francois Chartier, who wrote the book that we're, I'm referring to, he's big in sake and big into flavor pairings of sakes and using chemical, like chemical analysis and flavor, flavor analysis to like pull out flavor compounds in the sake and matching it with food, which is a really, I think is, is a really great way to like give wine people a way into sake to like focus on flavors and then 
through that enthusiasm, they can learn more about um, more about like the styles and things like that. But starting with like flavors and food pairing. Uh, I think Nick's bringing the book and I'll write it down. It's uh, taste buds and molecules. Yeah. Mm. These, oh, I wrote it to um, <laughs> and to these, okay. And he has a, he has a sake. Mm -hmm. um, Francois Chartier. I thought his sake was, good. I've only had it once, but. I've, I've never tasted it. It's very expensive. It's like very expensive. Yeah. And every time I see it on a portfolio, the portfolio list, I'm like, is this the day I buy it? And it's never the day I buy it, but <laughs> one day. Yeah, it was really. Is it ever at like the SA, is it ever at the LCBO or like? I saw it at the LCBO in the last case, um, like a week, uh, no, more like two weeks ago. Oh. No, up there, I'll, I'll, I'll see. I'll text you. Maybe I'll buy it. Maybe I'll buy the bottle. That's easy enough. Yeah, six is or like twelve is a lot. I feel like I don't. I tasted it. Once, I don't need to have five more. Is what yeah. I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's great, but That's come on. That's <laughs> what I thought about that. Yeah. I think this with um, like mussels cooked in some curry ish flavors could be kind of fun. Sad. Or um, I had a, I saw a Lay's potato chips that was like grand masala flavored, I thought, you know, that kind of stuff. That's a great flavor. Potato chips and me are very close. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, this, uh, this sake is really great for warming because you get this sweetness from the noto style, the noto toji, but you also get um, uh, acidity and umami that is, is kind of hiding in there. Sometimes it doesn't seem like there's a lot of acidity, but if you analyze it, it's pretty high. So uh, when you warm it, it's sweeter and rounder and fatter, but the acidity just keeps it really tight. Um, Chizuko-san, who's a sake uh, Somalian samurai in New York, she is a, um, in her portfolio, she, she's a brand ambassador for a lot of sakes. Uh, this is in her portfolio and she has this, I think it's called like, what does she call it? Like basically ting my highball, uh, Yamaha high, high, Yama high highball or something like that. I can't remember what, there was a play on words. Um, but this over ice with soda and like a wedge of lemon was really good with the yakitori. Yeah, like going to like, um, or getting like some sort of skewered meat and this would be really good. Okay, enough about food. <laughs> and then the third sake we have is this Takacho uh, Bodaimoto. Cooking is chemistry frequently, yes, yeah. Which is why sometimes I don't have the patience for either, <laughs> for either chemistry or cooking. <laughs> Have Sean. Yeah, exactly. He has a lot more, definitely a lot more patience than I ever will. <laughs> when like eggs need to harden for a challenge machine and stuff, it's a little too much for me. <laughs> <laughs> this is a sake that is uh, not in Ontario. So I'm very excited. Oh, wow. See, it just like smells like a whole different world. Okay, so Takacho uh, Bodaimoto uh, from Nara. So these guys, also really young producer, like he's also like maybe mid thirties right now who took over and they're his um, flagship, maybe you call it, it's called Kaze no Mori, the, 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 um, the wind of the forest. And that one is like very modern. It's kind of like that same King Adamasa world. Um, but then this, Takacho Odaimoto is what they've been doing, um, I think, since like the 15th century. So very, very cool that we have it in, in BC. There's a Nama version that we don't get in BC, um, but this is, I think, a pretty good, pretty good expression. Yeah, the, the lactic note is always there, like that underlying sourness, but like it's so floral and like green, like it's like dill and like like this like fresh like foliage kind of smell cedar yeah maybe like the cedar barrels that they probably use and the cedar balls that they make at this in this town oh. Takacho or uh, uh, Soryucho is the name of the brewery they, they, 
this guy and uh, Mimurosugi are both like, I think similar age and from this very historical place and are really pushing um, to do more bodaimoto because it was only allowed to be called bodaimoto if they did it in this uh, particular temple. Uh, but then now they're saying, okay, you can do this method, but you don't have to make it the temple and call it um, bodaimoto. This is uh, like Shodakuji East, 70% polish and this uh, local rice, right? Yeah, it's really floral. I get that like piney greenness and also a lot of um, like caramel, mm, creme caramel or pudding, you know, those pudding cups style. Yeah. I'm gonna save some for Rachel. I think she'll appreciate this. Yeah. That's a very textured, great length, has this kind of electricity, this tension, which I think is really interesting. Mm. I get some like toasted rice as well. It's definitely um, like more syrupy and concentrated, but you, it's, it's not cloying. So fun. And this, if you warmed it, it would get like more um a little more quiet probably like less sharp but because of this acidity that's inherently there it's still going to be balanced and really tasty i think i would like to warm this pretty high like 55 and get it like make it come down or you know when you're blanching um <laughs> broccoli <laughs> kind of style i get hot and then like shock it over ice It'll be really tasty Mm -mm. It would be good with really something also very sweet. I think that like ice cream, like mm -hmm. something that will have cut, will eliminate the sugar that, that you perceive. And then you're going to be left with all those other flavors that we can feel in the background. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's really cool. Really good. Like a very good vanilla ice cream or mm. um, even uh, like dried, just like having um, good dried fruits with chocolate. You know, that sort of combination. Um, is this, yeah, ice cream would be good. This is from Shorakuji Temple. Uh, yeah, so this was the moto, the shubo would have been made at Shorakuji. Do I have a map? Okay, I have to, <laughs> I have to ask. I forgot, I forgot all about it. I'm, no, I, I forgot all about it. ask you about it. So we will send it to you. Um, tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. 100%, I apologize. We will put that into, into context for you there, yeah. Narrows down the middle and the bottom. Yes, very close to Kyoto. Not the bottom of the map, but bottom of the middle. <laughs> it's a very, very beautiful place. Like I used to, now that we, I, I know more Nara producers, I wish that I had visited more uh, instead of just like being annoyed at the deer park. You know the deer park? I didn't go to, I, I didn't go to Nara. It's, it's a little, uh, to be honest, like probably be a little bit quiet and boring. Uh, if you go to Kyoto, like you're getting like best of both worlds, but now people would hate me. Um, it, it's like quieter and I guess there's a lot of history, like older history, because right? it's the old capital. Um, but the there's a lot of, um, yeah, Simon's practicing his JSL skills. <laughs> Any map is a good map, okay. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, a lot of the temples have these uh, aggressive deer that you can feed with um, tourist trap, like shops that you buy deer feed with. Yeah, and feed it to the deer. Anyways, um, go to Nara when we can. Then the last talk, can we go back to this uh, Tatenokawa Jimadai Genjo, which is Sokujo. I might be a little bit shocked to the system after the Bodaimoto, um, but this is a really good producer from Yamagata Prefecture, um, made with Dewasan San rice. So this is that local uh, rice that um, has, has made Yamagata really famous actually. And you can smell, it's almost like smelling Sauvignon Blanc all of a sudden after all those kind of richer styles. Jumai Dai Genjo Nakadori, so it's the middle pressing. It's um, it's like the, the kind of the thickest part. It's the most purest part um, would be the definition and 50% polish. It's just a, like a really tasty, um, always, 
accessible. Uh, yeah, great example of Jumai Daigenjo made well. East number 14, and so you get that brightness and like fruitiness, but not like crazy either. Some of their sakes, I think um, they might, they use even more floral use, but it never gets out of, out of whack. They also have a sake called Phoenix that the band, the French band produced with them. And there's a new sake that these guys have made uh, with the Foo Fighters, which Michihiro and Kieran were like, oh, that sounds great. Well, Kieran said it like that. Michihiro said it a little differently. <laughs> but... Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine Kieran like a thousand ideas of how he's going to sell this sake mm -hmm. through the food. Oh, for sure. I was like, we don't even work with this sake brewer, Kieran. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But if you look, if you Google it later, it's like Foo Fighters sake. It'll come up. It's uh, it's meant to look like kanji, but it's it says F O O Fighters. It's pretty cool. I mean, I'm not. I don't necessarily listen to Foo Fighters, but they grow and you know they're great. Um, oh. Kind of interested in the sake for sure. I wonder what it tastes like. I mean, it's interesting that it's a you know a Western band that is like interested in developing a sake. I think that's kind of fun. Yeah, yeah, and then people are enjoying it so much that they're like, I want to make something with you. Um, why would a, polish, a brewer polish to a rate of daiginjo but call it a ginjo? Um, well, not this one, right? I don't, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, if you, just in general, if you polish a socket to 50%, like a daiginjo polish, and call it a ginjo, that's because um, they probably have a, a different daiginjo that maybe they polish more. So let's say there's a ginjo that's polished to 50 and then a daiginjo polished to 40 because they want to be a little more like, I don't know, extra with their polishing, right? Or say, well, just like, you know, don't want to call um, any other sake's daiginjos, maybe that's, maybe that's the stance that they're taking, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so not, not this one, but in general, um, you might, uh, just not want to call it that because Honjozo has certain connotations, so does Ginjo, so does Daiginjo, and it's that like market expectation or what you want to say with that name. If I call something a Honjozo or even a Tokubetsu Honjozo, most people expect like a you know more ricey or grainy, um, uh, kind of simpler drinking sake. Whereas even if that could, could be called a Ginjo, if you call it a Ginjo, people are wanting that like floral more fruity, a little sweeter style. So that's, uh, it's more about like what you want that sake to represent and who you want it, who, who you want buying that sake to, right? That's part of it, yeah. Okay. So why the trend is the, is the question I left with. And it's, um, yeah, so a lot of brewers are trying Kimoto for sure, or uh, not, not so much Yamaha. Yamaha doesn't, isn't exactly having like a moment necessarily, <laughs> but Kimoto is. And a lot of people say that the acidity that Kimoto gives is um, something that they think will add to the aging process, but also to, you know, exporting sake abroad or even to like the kind of food that we're eating, even in Japan or elsewhere, um, it lends itself better to, to pairings and food. But also this like back to basics um, philosophy that people like Aramasa again made really cool. Uh, we can't ignore the fact that it's just like a wave of, a wave of coolness that, that, that Kimoto now has, yeah. And I guess in Canada, like we, we, I, I definitely like in that's life's portfolio. We definitely work with a lot of Kimoto's uh, sake, but even you know not in our portfolio. I think we're starting to see a, a ton more uh, Yamaha Kimoto Bodaimotos out there. Yeah, but not that many Mizumoto Bodaimotos yet. So um, the this one, the Takacho that we had, sake number three is from Axis. I can I'll post that later, but Axis Planning, I think is their full name and they have a great portfolio. And then here, I guess in Toronto, we had the, um, what do we have? We have another Mizumoto. Oh, Hanata Moe. They both have that like sweet, intense. They definitely, yes, have that sweet, yeah. Very, more, much more sweeter on the palate. Yeah that like caramelized and also the color was completely different, you know, mm. like the um, Tengma Yamaha and the Bodaimoto had like similar color. Yeah, I think 
I want to say that was the case last time. I'll, yeah, look, at right? the video. I'll look at the video. You're I'm sure we may talk about the color. If you're doing that sort of brewing too, like Mizumoto Budaimoto, then um, uh, like it's not very polished. This is 70% polished, but even if you were polishing it more, um, you wouldn't charcoal filter and you wouldn't like, you know, interfere, interfere, like you wouldn't finish it as much. So yeah. I think that is a common uh, thing as well. Yeah. What did um, everyone like? Yeah, what's everyone's favorite? It'd be funny if everyone was like, Kazunokawa, sake number four. I mean, it's really good, but you know, it's like the more um, like refined one. I like number one. I liked it when I had it the first time and I still like it a lot. And it's not super expensive either. I mean, I think it's not. So sake number three is access funny. Yeah, Takacho is the most um, uh, most unique. Uh, is my GY. What's GY? Oh, you're your fave, I see. <laughs> I thought it was some sort of code for something else. I was thinking about like map terms, you know. Yeah, heating up the Takacho and Tengmai would be really cool. Oh, uh, work in the pouches, they should be okay, you know? Nick, do you know anything more about heating in these pouches? I think it'll be fine um, because I think I, I I know that they're food safe and I know that if we you couldn't heat something up, they would have to say. And I also think that if you put it in, immerse it in like some hot water, not boiling water, but hot water and not like on direct heat, they would absolutely be 100% fine. If anything, they're very they're very similar plastics to um, like sous vide bags um, because while this type is like screw cap, there is a lot that um, are heat sealed. So you have to use the that they use in a vacuum sealer. So yeah, you're um, you're going to be fine to put them in hot water. Um, and I mean, it would only in a pouch. It would take like a few minutes to heat, it, heat that through. Yeah, they might be actually like I, really ideal. Yeah. I think you might have like reinvented the, the sake and wine world with these pouches, Nick. I mean, <laughs> it is a thing. Yeah. Um, and this is, I, I like the silver. I like these a little bit more. I've got, uh, well, I have a whole fridge full, but for those who what we're talking about is that I use like a more of a papery color one uh, for my wine tasting. So, um, but these are fancy. I like these. Well, the paper ones is, is what we wanted and what I ordered. And then they told me I couldn't have them. Yeah, they're gone. They're gone. Like I re tried to reorder some and they're all gone. Miki at Dachi was actually kind of sad. She's like, oh, I really wanted the paper ones. That you know, That's like, fine. I'll send you, I'll send you <laughs> some, uh, just three, and you can just use them on special occasions. Just three, yeah, example. very special yeah. occasions. But I yeah. think you go for like, I saw if you are one of, I don't know, like creating a brand or product, you can get these like designed, right? Like, yeah. yeah. And then you can, I've seen like baby food ish looking things mm. online. So I imagine you can warm them up. Yeah. Um, yeah. These sakes are all available in Vancouver. Oh yeah, if you're gonna warm up sake, like you were saying, it like not 100 degrees. So if you put them in like warm water, 60 degrees, they should be fine. I can't see why they wouldn't be. Yeah, yeah it might be game changing. Uh, they're all available in Vancouver, um, but definitely in the private stores, restaurants. Uh, some of them, I think, Tatanokawa tends uh, can be at the be sale to be sometimes, um, but that one is through Fujiyama Imports. Yes, yeah, so the next round of sake at the same location, unless you would like to change that, but it's uh, the two locations are still Harvest, uh, thank Andrea, and at Vision, uh, thanks Harrison and uh, Brandon. Or you can, uh, others are having them delivered. Next class is regions, and within regions, we talk about rice, we talk about yeast. There is um, a lot to go through next week, too. Yeah. Simon, do they occasionally want to do it, or that you work at the brewery occasionally? I'm just trying to. 
<laughs> yeah, thank you. Oh, oh my God, I just. Uh, you broke his alto. Oh, wow. No, not his alto this time, but a normal. Wow, nonetheless, not good. Yeah, which brewery do you work at? First of all, I didn't know you work at a brewery. And yeah, uh, yeah, email me. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, yeah, just definitely email me, and uh, we can try to 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 work out something that'd be fun. Um, I feel like I should learn more about like yeast before talking to people at a brewery, beer brewery. Right? Or get like what's your price on the on the call, <laughs> something like that. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, we are. Uh, we can definitely do more things. So give me a show. Thanks, Nick. Uh, I Thanks, Mariko. I week. will get a map out to everyone tomorrow morning. <laughs> you'll be sleepy, but you'll be all sleepy. Uh, pretty map. Vancouver people, uh, but I will have it before you wake up in the morning. There'll be a little map. For you. Actually, the maps are really easy, um, and they're fun because they help me figure out where in where in Japan all these sakes are from. We so I appreciate uh, people using them. Yeah. Um, have a lovely evening. I will see you next week, Mariko. I guess it'll be fun for you. Yeah. See you next week. Session regionality. It's going to be a good one. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. Bye.